Hello, everybody. Today, what we're going to look at is <clears throat> what is the difference between a real gas versus an ideal gas? Now, you might be wondering, um, what, is, what is a real gas? Well, a real gas are the gases that you and I are used to being surrounded by, such as oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, even some other gases uh, like the noble gases, um, helium, argon, krypton. These are all real gases, okay? Now, an ideal gas is really something that doesn't exist. It's an imaginary gas. And why do we even consider something called an ideal gas? Well, it has to do with something you learned earlier called the kinetic molecular theory pertaining to gases. <clears throat> there were some assumptions that we made. We're going to focus on two particular assumptions. The first one is that a real gas does have volume. However, the volume is so little that we can basically say that the volume is negligible. Okay, so we can say that the volume is approximately equal to zero. Now, here's the reason. Whenever you see a gas in a container, what we do is we make the particles of a gas really far apart from each other. Now, I want you to think about it. Compare the volume that is actually occupied by the gas itself compared to the volume of the container. If you think about it, the volume of every individual particle is tiny. Look at all the space in that container. All that empty space, okay, compared to the actual volume occupied by a gas, it's, it's basically that gases don't even have volume, okay? In fact, we're going to assume that the volume of the gas is so little that we're going to say it's zero. So an ideal gas is a gas that has no volume, but a real gas does. But if, if I'm confusing you, okay, and that's not the point here, it's... A real gas has volume, but it's so little, so negligible that we're going to say that gases don't have volume. That's our first assumption. Here's the second. We are going to assume that gases do not interact with each other. Neither attractive nor repulsive forces. We're going to make this assumption. In real life, real gases do attract and do repel. But in our ideal world here... An ideal gas would be a gas that has neither attraction nor repulsion. Now, why are we making this assumption? Again, it has to do with distance. Look how far the particles are to each other. If you look at this particle here and this particle here, okay, there's so much distance between them that we're going to assume that they don't interact. But in the real world, they do. It's just that the interactions are very minimal. So the two assumptions going back is we're going to assume that an ideal gas has no volume, but in real life it does. It's just very small. And two, we're going to assume that gases do not attract nor repel, but in the real world, real gases do show attraction. They do show repulsion. It's just very weak because they're very far apart. Okay, so take a look at this picture here. <clears throat> this is an explanation of what can I do as a scientist to make a real gas behave more like an ideal gas. Well, anything that you can cause the particles to get further from each other will make a real gas behave more like an ideal gas. <clears throat> you see, on the left, notice how far apart the particles are. This picture over here is showing you gases behaving more like an ideal situation. On the right, this is non-ideal. This is more like how a real gas behaves because notice that the particles are a little closer. So how can I get gases to look more like the diagram on the left? Well, if I increase temperature, it will cause particles to spread out. So if I increase the temperature, to let's say the container on the right, it will cause those molecules to spread out. And the more they spread out, did you notice how much empty space there is? The more they spread out, the volume gets closer and closer to zero. Okay? What's another thing I can do? 
to cause molecules to spread out. Another thing you could do is to lower the pressure. You see, when you lower the pressure, you allow particles to scatter. The more particles, as they get further and further apart from each other, the volume gets closer to zero, and more importantly, the less likely they're going to attract or repel. So if you are asked, what are two things that you can do to cause a real gas to behave more like an ideal gas? You have two scenarios. You can either A, increase the temperature, or B, decrease the pressure. Either one of those two things will cause gases to scatter. The more they scatter, the less likely they're going to attract and repel, which is what an ideal gas is. An ideal gas is a gas that, has, that shows no attractions and no repulsions. Notice on the right, the particles are at a lower temperature, so they're moving slower. That means that they can interact more. Notice they're at a higher pressure. Whenever you uh, increase the pressure, you're forcing particles to come closer together. The closer the particles are, the more likely they're going to interact and attract and repel. So if you had to pick which container does do the gases behave more like an ideal gas, obviously container on the left would be the correct answer. Now, how do we get that container? Again, either by increasing the temperature or decreasing the pressure. That's how you can get a real gas to behave more like an ideal gas. So basically, this is a summary of what I just said, okay? Real gases will behave more like ideal gases when the molecules are sufficiently apart and have sufficiently high kinetic energy. So how do you give molecules more kinetic energy? Increase the temperature, okay? How do you get molecules to get further and further apart? Well, you can either increase the temperature, that'll cause them to expand, or decrease the pressure that will allow molecules to separate from each other with more ease. So real gases behave closer to ideal situations over a, a, over a wide range of temperatures and pressures. And to be honest, the higher the temperature or the lower the pressure would be the two conditions that would cause a real gas to behave more like an ideal gas. Now, there are, I'm going to divide gases into three categories, okay? The noble gases, if I had to choose, would be the group of gases that behave the most like an ideal gas. If I had to pick which gases behave more like an ideal gas, I would say the noble gases, as you know, they're in the uh, last uh, group of a periodic table, okay? I listed helium and neon here, but you also have argon. Uh, that's a noble gas. You got krypton, you got xenon, you got radon, okay? <clears throat> noble gases, because they are inert, because they don't attract, they're the ones that behave the most like an ideal gas. Remember the second assumption. An ideal gas is a gas that neither attracts nor repels. Noble gases are the ones that behave the most like that because it is their nature not to interact, neither attract, no repel. Okay? Now, there's another category. <clears throat> Gases can be nonpolar or polar. The, this second tier of gases, which are the nonpolar, would be any diatomic gas. Uh, I wrote nitrogen and hydrogen, but chlorine, oxygen, okay, fluorine, these are also diatomic gases. If bromine were to become a gas, because bromine's a liquid at room temperature, or um, iodine, which is an, a solid at room temperature, if these guys were in the gas phase, okay, they're all nonpolar. Now, there are other nonpolar gases, like carbon dioxide is a nonpolar gas. And if you are a nonpolar gas, okay, what they do attract to each other, okay, because nonpolar does attract to other nonpolars, but the attraction between nonpolars is a very weak intermolecular force, a very weak force of attraction. Now, if you had to choose between the first category, which is the noble gases, and this category, the nonpolar gases, probably the nonpolar gases would interact a little bit more 
than the noble gases. That's why the noble gases are your best scenario for gases that if you had to pick, behave the most like an ideal gas. This would then be the second best scenario, the nonpolar gases. They do interact with each other, but not very strongly. But do remember, these are real gases, and they do show a little bit of attraction and repulsion. Now, look what I'm going to do. Here's the interesting part. There's a third group. The third group are polar gases, okay? Like water vapor. Water vapor, okay? Water is like this. Water is a polar molecule. So I'm going to put a negative there by the oxygen and a positive here by the hydrogen. I'm going to draw another water molecule. Now let's say we're in the air and these are gases. This is steam or water vapor, okay? What happens is the force of attraction between polar molecules is much stronger than the force of attraction between nonpolar molecules. Even though gases are separated, polar gases tend to be the ones that can interact the most with each other. I'm drawing a little dotted line to show you that the oxygen end of this water down here uh, is attracting to the positive end of the other water. There's a very weak force of attraction going on there, okay? Um, because there's a force of attraction, polar gases, and you'll see it right here in the second statement, these are the gases that deviate the most from ideal behavior. In fact, the polar gases are the ones that behave the least like an ideal gas. Ammonia is another polar gas, okay? And the same thing happens here. Uh, the nitrogen is the negative end. The hydrogen is the positive end. I'm going to draw another ammonia sideways over here. And I'm going to show you, again, the negative end is the hydrogen. I'm sorry, the nitrogen. And the hydrogen is the positive. Notice there's a force of attraction there, okay? Because polar gases are the ones that have uh, the most forces of attraction compared to the three categories. The polar gases are the ones that behave the least like an ideal gas. In other words, they are the ones that behave more like a real gas. So let me give you a little summary. Here are the three categories of the gases, okay? And out of these three, if you had to pick who behaves most like an ideal gas, I would have to say the noble gases would be your best choice. Who behaves the least like an ideal gas? or which one deviates the most from ideal behavior, it would be the polar gases. The non-polars are somewhere in the middle, okay? And if you remember, don't forget that the conditions that will cause a real gas, and here's a gas here, to behave more like an ideal gas is if you increase the temperature, it will cause these guys to not only move faster, by the way, the faster they're moving, the less likely they're going to interact with each other, okay? Notice that when they spread out, the volume gets closer and closer to zero, which is one of the assumptions. Also, when you decrease the pressure, which is the other thing, you allow the, the gases to expand. See, high pressure keeps the particles closer together. The minute you lower the pressure, you allow them to separate, and again, the more they separate, the more the volume gets closer to zero, and more importantly, the further they are apart from each other, the less likely they're going to interact. So that's how you get a real gas to behave more like an ideal gas, all right? So this is something that you might want to read in your book um, after this explanation so you can get a good idea having me said the main points as to the difference between a real gas versus an ideal gas, which is basically an imaginary gas based on those two assumptions that we spoke of, okay?